Hi, good morning, South Bay Bible Church. Um, hope you're doing well. Hope you had a good week. Um, you know, I had a good week. Uh, uh, it started with, um, last week, uh, with uh, a wedding that I went to. Went to. Um, it was the first of its kind that I've ever done. Um, but I, I love weddings. They're so fun. Um, and, you know, you can definitely tell that love was evident. Love was there. And I loved what... Um, the pastor gave a message about and it wasn't always you know it wasn't about the lovey-dovey grace stuff um lovey-dovey stuff it was about grace and it was about how you know this is just the beginning um and it was great that the service was really just bringing focus and attention and glory to god and just evident of um, the gospel message and you know their marriage won't always be roses every day um i I'm, I'm sorry, honey, but um, I know mine hasn't. Uh, I can't tell you what my vows were, sorry. Or or I can't promise you that I've kept them every day. Um, but, but we know one thing is true, that we continue to love each other, we continue to extend grace, and... Um, and, and the day after um, is what uh, Pastor, Pastor Sebastian was talking about. So I don't know if you remember. Um, but he was talking about light and love. And sometimes, um, especially during the shelter in place, with people so far away, it might be hard or it might require a lot of additional extra effort to extend that love, let people know that you're thinking of them, that you care about them. And for people who um, might be a little too close for comfort, um, might be kind of hard to also love them just because they know how to push your buttons so easily. Um, and so I wanted just to keep that going, to talk about love, talk about grace. I'm going to sing a song called um, Wonderful Cross, um, and it talks about um, just the gospel message, you know, and it's, it's so amazing, so divine, um, that as we walk with God and as we continue to understand Him, um, that that hopefully um the goal is that we just be so overwhelmed that it would just overflow and outpour um out of our lives and it, it demands us um just the obedience in, in following him so um let's pray and let's sing and let's continue to give god glory um actually before we um pray if you can stand with me um i'm i'm standing i, I encourage you to stand people always sound so great when they stand um if, if you're a little concerned, you can close the shades. It's okay. No one's going to know. But you know what? If you don't care, open up those shades. Open up those windows. Um, let your neighbors know um, that you want to give God glory today for the wonderful cross and what it represents. Okay, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love, your grace, um, the example um, that Jesus Christ um, gave um, just about um, sacrifice, um, and forgiveness and um, loving us again and again. Um, thank you for um, this time. Um, I pray that this song would just be honoring to you. I pray that we would <sighs> stand or sit or kneel um, and just uh, give you our all this morning. Um, so it's because it's what you um, so deserve. Um, yeah, in your name. Amen. Let's get a try. <clears throat>
Our scripture for this morning comes from Hebrews 13, 1 to 8. Um, though it's really easy to just watch the screen lately, I encourage you all to still have your Bibles handy, um, or I hope you have multiple devices that you can follow along and still look up the verse, because I encourage you to go back to it. Physically mark up a Bible as you study it, or meditate on it as we continue in worship. Um, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to find a Bible. Okay, now let's read it together. Hebrews 13, 1 to 8. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, this unprecedented time of shelter in place has definitely encouraged me to be content with what I have. And even though it might be hard, it's nothing like real prison or real suffering that I know people are going through. So I hope this passage encourages you as it did me to not only love one another, but make your love evident. Not only pray for those suffering, um, but spiritual leaders in our lives. Um, and to lastly have confidence in our Lord, our helper, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, I've heard the biggest obstacle in God moving sometimes in our lives is us. Um, so whoever might be drained, hurt, or, or battling something today, I pray that during this next song that you just ask God in. Um, and so if you do, have confidence in God and heed the help that he gives. Be willing to be led and willing to follow. Oh, who are we? 
Good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us again online for our Sunday service. And I want to give a special thank you to both Joanna and for, to Glennie for leading us in that time of worship. And yeah, it's just good to see them and to be led by them and to be encouraged to remember about um, the cross of Christ and to remember that uh, wherever God leads, we must follow. And so thank you guys so much for that reminder. And uh, happy Memorial Day weekend to all of you who are um stuck in home so uh we're gonna do a little bit of a different thing for the greeting i i just miss seeing all of you um but because we're doing this through youtube there's no way for you to um you know to see your faces um but if you are watching this as it as it's live um i want to see if you can write a little comment on the chat box and just check in and just say hello good morning and um if you have a uh you know since it's memorial day uh um just think about one place that you want to go to after <laughs> just just write that in the the chat box there and then uh we'll we'll all uh, see who's here and just say hello to one another um so say hello and say one place that you would like to visit or travel to at once this whole thing is over. Take some time there. Find the chat box and, and just say hello so we can uh, say hi to each other. All right. So hopefully uh, you got a chance to see some people online um, and say hello to them. Um, so let's go into the message right now. We're going to continue in our series of Essential. We're going to continue actually in the same chapter, 1 John chapter 2. All right, so for those of us who grew up in the uh, the 2000s, you instantly know um, this, this uh, image that I've brought up here. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is from the movie The Matrix, um, and this is a picture of your, what you're seeing is um, Morpheus's face and his sunglasses, a reflection of the of the hero Nero, of the hero Neo, um, uh, deciding which pill to take, the red pill or the blue pill. <laughs> and this phrase, the red pill, take the red pill, has suddenly become a very relevant illustration. <laughs> this movie is very old, um, but it's it's very relevant today. And the reason why it's relevant is because we live in a very politically divided world. And uh, one of the major players in the Bay Area uh, mentioned this, um, take the red pill earlier this week. Um, and there was a huge firestorm of controversy over this whole um, illustration. Take the red pill, take the blue pill. Um, the reason why it's so controversial is because we live in a 
very divided world. We know what it's like to have lines drawn in the sand. We know what it likes to um, to be in one group and excluded from another group. Um, we know what it's like to experience division. We're living in those times more so now than ever before. And what we're going to read today in the book of First John um, is also about division. And for the church, this is a very essential division to make. So I want to recap a little bit because as we're going through um, this series of essential, um, it's easy to forget what is essential as we're going week by week by week. So what are the essentials for the Christian life? What have we learned already? And how do we fellowship with God? The first thing foremost is we must encounter Jesus, encountering the incarnate word of life. Secondly, we must walk in the light. And what does it mean to walk in the light? First of all, it's about confession not perfection, meaning that we are honest with God about our sin and our need of a Savior. Secondly, to walk in light means that there is evident love for your church. Is love evident in your life for your brothers and your sisters? Evident love. That's how we check if we are walking in the light. So today, as we go and continue in the book of 1 John, we're going to ask again, what does it mean to walk in the light? And what does the scripture ask of us today? So I ask you to bow your heads with me as we go to God in prayer. Let's pray. God, I thank you for just this time where we can um, just set aside the, the chores and the work from home or just some of the worries and anxieties that have been on our minds and hearts and we can come together knowing that we're not alone, that there are, that our brothers and sisters, that our church family is, is right alongside us um, in prayer, in worship, and in, in the word. And so, God, I thank you for binding us together, for gathering us even now online. Um, and today, God, I just pray for um, encouragement to flow from your spirit to all of us here. It's been a... Um, yeah, it's, it's been difficult. It's been a challenge for us, God, to not be able to meet, and we miss seeing each other. And so, God, I just ask for a, a spirit of encouragement, God, to come right now, um, to, to, to flood into people's homes and rooms and hearts and, and their minds so that, that the worries will be lifted away, that the burdens will be casted down, um, that the anxiety will flee, God, because your spirit of encouragement and power is going to be there. And so, God, um, open our hearts to your word. May we be fertile soil. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's read our passage for today. Our passage is found in the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verse 12. And we're going to go through this in two sections. So first, uh, we're going to go through 12 through 14 right here. So you can follow along on the screen, or you can go and turn into uh, your actual Bibles. So <clears throat> 1 John, chapter 2, verse 12. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. So I want to um, just, if you have turned to your Bibles, um, or if you look this up on another like Bible gateway or something else, you'll notice that there is a, a heading um, in the scriptures. In the NIV, the passage has a heading called reasons for writing, meaning that the, the people that um, edited the, the Bible together, um, they, they put this heading to describe this passage, and they called it reasons for writing. The reasons why um, John is writing this letter. Um, you know, it's, and you think about it, it's a, it's a kind of a strange thing to put in the middle of the second chapter of the book. Um, reasons for writing. You know, you write, 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 and then in the middle, you say, actually, this is why I'm writing. <laughs> it's kind of a strange placement, right? Um, so instead of viewing this section as just, you know, what the NIV says as reasons for writing, I think that the reason that this, pas this, this passage was written is not just like to tell them why um, that they that this this letter exists, but the reason that this passage exists is to reassure the church members that John is writing to about their own fellowship with God. Why? Why does he write this? John has been drawing a pretty hard line in the sand. 
over the past chapter and a half. He's been talking about, you know, belief in trust in the and encountering Jesus, the incarnate word of life. He's been talking about how God is light and how we must walk in the light to confess our sins and to obey the commands of God and to, to love our brothers and our sisters. He's been drawing a very, 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 um, you know, distinct, firm, hard line in the sand. And like many of us, when we are presented with scripture um, that convicts us, that speaks to where we're at, it can feel like, like a sword that cuts right to our heart. And we get filled with, and we, we read, passages like the ones like last week where it says you know um those who if you how do we know that we know god is if we keep his commands i'm like oh my gosh i i sin i i sin and i'm filled with guilt and i'm filled with insecurity am i even saved does god even love me and so as john is you know listing at all the all these tests of ways to figure out if you are walking in the light um if he's listing out all these things that we should be aiming and striving for what john is saying here right in this passage in john chapter 2 verse 12 the reason for writing technically um it's it's not so much a reason for writing but it's a reassurance of the church's own fellowship with god what john is saying here and you know if you can see on the on the screen um you know it's very clearly poetically structured you know so well, we're, t we're taking the whole passage here. What's, what's, the, what's the thrust of this, this whole passage? The thrust of it is John is saying, I see your faith. Not only that, I see the fruit of your faith. He is reassuring his church. And he is, first of all, calling them dear children. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. And here, we have to read this poetically. He's not calling, he's not just writing to the little kids. He's not writing to the Zacharys and the Evelyns and the Ethans and the Josiahs and all the other kids. He's not writing to just kids, but he's writing to the children of God, right? And why is, what, so what's the main thrust of this passage? You are a child of God. You are a child of God. He's reassuring the church that in spite of all their shortcomings, in spite of all the ways that they have maybe not walked in the light perfectly, regardless of that, he's taking the time right now in the middle of chapter two, <laughs> not at the beginning, but like right in the middle after he's already laid out a bunch of stuff, a bunch of things that they might have felt guilt or insecurity about. He's reminding them that you are a child of God. You are a child of God. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. And then verse 14, I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. You are a child of God and you are in fellowship with God. John, John is reassuring his church, his church members, that they are in fellowship with God. Um, and so we can continue here that you are a child of God. Um, let's, let's look what it means. What is he saying? You are a child of God who is what? Forgiven in verse 12. You are, your sins have been forgiven, child of God. Um, verse 13, you know, the, the older, more mature people, you fathers, you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you younger people, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And then if we go back um, to, to verse 14 in the middle, it says, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the, exactly the same. And then the next verse, I write to you young men because you are strong. The word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Um, so what is John saying here? Yeah, like, this is addressed to all the children in the church, not the kids in the church, but all the church members. Um, and he's writing here. He's, he's saying here, young and old people alike, those who have, um, those who have walked a long time with God, who have known God from the beginning, um, to, to the people who are young in, in God, you have already overcome the evil one by belief in Jesus. Um, so regardless if you are young in the faith or you are old and, and wise in the faith, everyone has worth and value in the family of God. You know, um, it's, it's very interesting here, um, the distinction, fathers versus young men. Right now, I feel like a, a young father. <laughs> Um, who is not very experienced, but I still have all the responsibilities that come with being a father. Um, and, and you know, it, it's, it's so interesting because when um, you see this distinction here, I'm writing to you fathers. What John is mentioning here, um, he, he's not saying like those who are just fathers, but he's saying those who are older, um, those who are more mature in the faith. Um, and that's, that's, he's talking about wisdom here. I'm writing to you, wise people because your your wisdom is no, is rooted in the knowledge of who Christ is. I'm writing to you younger people, um, those who are not as wise. But you have 
passion because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, Yomi, because you are strong. The word of God lives in you. You've overcome the evil one. Um, so there's there's value in in wisdom, and but there's also value in people who are just coming and new to the faith. There's this. I, I mean, if you try to remember when um, when when you first came to know Christ, um, what it was like uh, for some of us. Uh, it might have been when you were really little, when you were in elementary school or middle school or high school. Um, some of us came to faith much later in life, maybe uh, when you were already working with your career or you already had a family. Regardless of how old you were, when you when you were born again, when you were new in the faith, there's this, this, you're filled with passion. You're filled with this desire and hunger for the Word of God. You're, you're filled with this ability, this, um, this, uh, the spirit that, that is on fire to want to overcome and go into battle. You want to overcome the evil one. John is just describing here what it's like to be young in the faith and what it's like to be old in the faith. Both have value in the children of God. Both have value in the family of God. And so John is, is, uh, is just reassuring his people, reassuring his church members that they are in fellowship with God, that there is that their, their faith, he sees the fruit of it, and he knows that, you know, He's giving them a lot of commands to follow, a lot of rules and things to think about. But he wants to reassure them that they are the children of God. They are forgiven, that they, they know him who is from the beginning, that they, they, they overcome the evil, and that they are strong, that the word of God lives in them. And so I, I think um, for us, as uh, you know, it's been like 10 weeks of uh, shelter in place. It's been... Um, yeah, it's, it's been a while. And uh, I think for some of us here, we just need some reassurance. We need some encouragement. We need to know that, um, that God sees our, our faith. He sees our devotion, that he sees our, our sacrifice uh, that we're making um, for him. Um, and this passage, this, this passage, I think, was a good break um, just from hitting, hitting us with, with uh, you know, conviction and truth and, and, and striving, but sometimes we need to take a little break to be, to be comforted by the Word of God, to be reassured by the Word of God, to understand that yeah, this is the way that God sees us, that we are His children. The way we think about, we, call, we sing songs about being the, uh, a child of God, like, I'm no longer a slave to fear, but I'm, I am a child of God. Like, what does it mean, right? Um, it means this, that you're forgiven. Your sins are forgiven, child of God. If you, if you trust and believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your sins are forgiven. Um, if you're a child of God, you know who, you know the Father. You know him who was from the beginning. You know Jesus. You are strong. The word of God lives in you, and you can overcome. You're victorious. We are victorious, forgiven, strong children of God. The word of God lives in us. And so... Receive that. Just receive that encouragement. Um, I know I needed to, to hear this this week as well, um, just to be lifted in my spirit and to be um, encouraged as this, this shelter in place keeps going on, um, to know that God sees us and to know that we are his children. So let's keep going because John is um, reassuring his church. Um, you know, I see the faith in you. And it's coming from a pastoral heart because he's building them up, but he's also going to call them um, to something more. Next passage here. Verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now here is where the division takes place. This is where the division needs to take place. Is there going to be love for the world or is there going to be love for the Father? Is that red pill or blue pill? Which one are you going to love? Which one are you going to choose? So, what do you love? What do you love? Children of God, what do you love? What do you love? We go back to the passage. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So if you notice, the word world is there many times. So what does, you know, we first, we need to figure out what John means when he says world. What does he mean when he says world? 
And, and in the Greek, wor wor the word world is cosmos in Greek, and it has a couple ways of usage. Um, cosmos could mean the creation. Um, it could also mean the material world, like um, the shirt, everything else that you see. Or it could mean even just humanity, people. You think of a famous verse in John's Gospel, John 3.16, God so loved the world, right? And in that sense, he's talking about people. Um, the way that John uses the word cosmos or world here, as we read in context, it refers to not just the material world, not just like the air and the trees and stuff, um, but he, he's specifically using it to describe um, the world set against God. How do I see that? If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, and then John describes what everything in the world is, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's that's not everything in the world, right? Like, So he's obviously referring to not just um, the world as the, all of its creation or all of the material things, but specifically the things in the world set against God. That's what he's referring to. Do not love the world or anything in the world. For everything in the world, everything set against God, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. So um, that's what John is referring to when he says world, not just you know the air and the water and the ground, but he's talking about, or just people, he's talking about specifically the things in this world that are set against God, that pull us away from God our father. And so what are the things that pull us away from the father? Verse 16, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These, these three things are very famous, actually. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Um, it's very famous for, for Christians and people familiar with the scriptures. Um, a lot of people have tried to categorize and, and draw distinctions between all of these things. But first of all, we must figure out what the word lust means. Lust. In, in the Greek, Lust means um, desire or craving. Um, it's a craving. And for many of us, the, the cravings that we feel being locked in our homes um, is basically to go outside <laughs> or to meet with people and meet with our friends. We have this craving to, to go and, and get food or go out and travel or whatever it is, um, get boba. <laughs> um, but um, for us, what we're, we're understanding more clearly now in, in our shelter in place, there's a difference between what's, a, what's essential and what's a craving. <laughs> and so for here, um, as John uses the word lust, he's talking about desire. He's talking about craving. So the, for everything in the world set against God, the, the, the cravings of the flesh, the, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, what is, you know, all of these things, um, Let's, let's, let's go a little bit deeper in this. The lust of the flesh. The flesh. Flesh in scripture, sarx, is, is not just like our body, but the way that it's referred to, especially in, in John's um, usage of it. The flesh refers to um, like this fallen, sinful nature. So it's talking about the lust of the flesh, meaning the, the cravings of our sinful nature inside of us. The sinful desires that originate within us. It could be, you know, ungodly immorality or sexual desires or immoral desires that that seek to harm and take and twist what God has given to us. Um, so that's that's the, that's the sinful nature inside of us, the desires that that come from within. But there's also the lust of the eyes, the desire of what we see, the things that we see all around us. Um, and and for me, when I think about this, is so the lust of the flesh comes from within. Um, but the lust of the eyes, the sinful desires, these are things that are coming from the outside. They're, they're just hitting us, pelting us over and over. The lust of the eyes, desire, seeing, and um, the, the, the way that I view this, the lust of the eyes, it's, it's jealousy. Um, uh, jealousy that leads to sin and immorality. The things that we look at, saying, I need that. I want that. I'm craving that. It could be a person, it could be something immoral, it could be a thing, it could be money, it could be whatever it is, the lust of the eyes that leads to sin and immorality. And then the pride of life, what does that mean? Pride of life. Well, thinking about that, pride of life, um, basically what that means is it's boasting pride in our way of life. <laughs> boasting in our way of life, the pride of life. And 
the way that John is referring to this life, what is this life referring to? Life apart from God. Basically, boasting in our ability to provide for ourselves. Boasting in our self-sufficient me. Self-sufficiency. And it's just saying, the pride of life is, 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 is basically, I was thinking about pride of life. Um, it's like, look at me and look at my stuff. <laughs> look at me and look at my stuff. Look at how, how awesome I am. And uh, it's, it's, you know, there's an app for that. It's called Instagram. It's the pride of life, right? And so all of these things, everything in the world comes not from the Father, but from the world. These desires, these cravings, the sinful nature, the, the, the things that pelt us over and over again that just cause us to want to lust after something, the desires, and then this, this boastfulness that builds up in us once we achieve what we want. Um, look at me. Look at my stuff. Um, these desires come not from the Father, but they come from the world. They come from, the, they don't come, they don't, it's not the Father's intent, but it, it's the world's intent to draw us away from the Father. And so verse 17, John, John says the truth here. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So what does that have to do with anything here? Um, what does that have to do with love? What does that have to do with not loving the world? Like, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. What we have to understand here is that John is opening the church's eyes to think about more than just what is in front of them, right? The world and its desires pass away, even though they're so tempting. It causes us to crave and causes us to lust. It, it, those things pass away. And, um, but the will, whoever does the will of God lives forever. You know, will of God, will of God is really interesting here. Will, the word will, um, in the Greek means desire. So you can read this again, you know, substituting the word will for desire. The, the world and its desires pass away. But whoever does what God desires lives forever. Right? So this is, this is the thing that John is getting at here. Um, if we want to be in fellowship with God, if we want to uh, walk in the light, if we want to be with God, it means, to, it means saying no to the world. But saying no to the world means saying yes to living forever. That's, that's what John is saying here. And so um, as we think about the world and its desires passing away, I don't need to illustrate this anymore. We know how fragile our world is. We know how quickly things can pass away. Um, and we know how difficult it is for so many people right now. I'm just thankful that many of us in our church are still able to work and still able to, we're still able to, to meet online. Um, but we know, we know intrinsically now, we know very intimately now that the world and its desires pass away. These things are temporary. Societies can fall very quickly. But whoever does the will of God lives forever doesn't that ring so true today isn't that something that we all want we want to live forever we don't want to 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 be swept up by this virus we don't want to be we don't want to uh, meet our end uh, at an untimely uh, way but we want to live forever and so john is appealing to us don't look at the things of this world don't love the things of this world because they're all going to pass away if you don't want to pass away, you know what doesn't pass away? People who do the will of God. So what does that mean, to do the will of God? It means to do what God desires, do what the Father desires. And what does the Father desire? That's the question for us. What does the Father desire? He desires our hearts. The Father desires our hearts. He doesn't want empty religion. He doesn't want lip service. The Father wants your heart. And now, more than ever, it's a time where the church is being refined in our heart. You know, this, meeting online, watching this on YouTube, this is not the way we're meant to live. This is not the way that we're meant to be a church. And, you know, even before the coronavirus impacted us, we were... We as a society, we are already drifting towards isolation, towards being more and more separated from one another. But 
even though now it is mandated that you don't go to church, here you are. <laughs> so I want to thank you. But if this is it, if this is the only time that you spend with God, that you spend with your brothers and sisters, that can't be it. That can't be it. This is not the way we're meant to do church. This is not the way that we are meant to be the church. This is not the way that we are meant to live. Don't let this be it. We can't let this time be it. We need to give God our whole hearts. We need to surrender our hearts and our lives to God. And from a place of surrender, God can move our hands and move our feet to do good. And from a place of surrender, God can, um, you know, show use us to show compassion and show mercy and, and to worship and to pray and to, to be there for one another, to support one another. So again, why did John write this letter? Why did John write this letter? It's because he saw how his people have fought to stay faithful to God in difficult times, just like the way that you are going to church online right now, going to church on YouTube right now. You're fighting to stay faithful to God. Be encouraged that you are, the ch you are a child of God. You know God the Father. You have been forgiven of your sins. That you have the strength of God, the word of God inside of you. And you can overcome the evil one. Be encouraged by that. So then why this exhortation and warning to not love the world? Because we can't just live off of encouragements. We can't just live off of our old victories. We can't just fight once when we're young and leave it, you know, just leave the rest of the fighting to the young people. This battle that we are facing to choose to love the Father over to over loving this world is a daily, lifelong struggle to the end. And we need to continually have new testimonies of overcoming. We need to be, be filled. Our lives need to be filled with new wine. And that is what John is hoping for, for his church and what I hope for, for you today. So what does it mean to love the Father? What does it mean to really love the Father? I think of um, my son. <laughs> I don't think he understands what it means to love his father. But for me, I understand that he loves me, even though he doesn't understand love. So the first thing is to love the father doesn't require complete understanding. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the truth right there. I know my son loves me. He doesn't understand what love is, doesn't even know, but he loves me. So how do we love the Father? We don't, we don't understand we don't understand God. It's impossible. We can't understand even how to love him perfectly. That's so so out of our the realm of possibility. But we with what we have and in our identity we can love the Father. It's not about perfect understanding. It's just because we are his children. If we live and understand that that we are children of God. That's, that's, that's step one. That's, that's all you need right there. Zachary, my kid, doesn't understand anything. But all he knows is that I'm his dad. And that, to me, shows me that he loves me. If we understand who our Father is, who our Heavenly Father is, if we know him, we know who we are, that we are his children, that is a way to love the Father. It's about living into our identity as his child. See, when we let the world dictate the way that we live, when we love the world, we let it dictate our desires, we let it dictate what we want and the way that we live. We're living as if the world gave us life. We're living as if the world provides. We're living as if the world protects. But to love the Father or to love the world, there's a division that needs to take place, guys. So be encouraged. Know that you are the children of God. But because you are the child of God, you need to make a distinction in the way that you live, the way that you love. Are you going to choose loving the things of this world that are apart from God, that are pulling you away from God? Immorality, immorality, sexual immorality, um, sin, jealousy, pride, boasting. Or are you going to live into the identity that you are a child of God? Um, I think that's, that's the message for today, that we must be children of God who love their Father. Can we do that? You know, because the world and its desires will pass away, but those who do what the Father desires will live for eternity. Um, so, what God desires, the love 
He just wants our love. He wants our hearts. So how do we do the will of God? We live into this identity. Children of God who love their Father. We give our hearts and our lives to Him. And I want to share a song with you guys uh, that I wrote at the beginning of this whole shelter in place. Just the day I remember finishing it as I was watching a press conference about the shelter in place being announced for the first time. Uh, it's now 10 weeks of shelter in place and, and you know, it's, it's been a long time. But I didn't realize that what I had written was directly lifted from this passage. Um, it just says this, This world is not my home, just passing through. So I'll leave it all behind just to be with you. And then it goes into this, uh, this, this verse of, of asking God to search. What am I living for? What am I hoping for? Do I have, what are the lusts of, of the flesh? What are the lusts of the eyes? Where do I place my trust? Do I see you as enough? Is there pride in my life? Search my heart, God. But it ends in encouragement. I know how this story ends, that my life is secure because God has us in his hands. And I know how this story ends. I will be with you forever. It's totally lifted from this passage. I had, I had not referenced this passage, but I, I couldn't just get this out of my head. I'm like, why, why, how did this happen? It's just, to me, this is a, just an affirmation, an affirmation and encouragement that God is saying to us that he is with us, that he's, he's, he's bringing things together to reveal more about how he is in control of all of this that's happening. So be encouraged, everyone. Be encouraged. You are a child of God. And as a child of God, just live as children of God. Childlike love for your Father. Childlike love for your Father. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much that you sent your Son to die on the cross for us. I thank you so much that, God, you did not leave us without, you know, just, you did not leave us alone. You did not forsake us, God, in this time. But even through, through this time, through your word, that you are encouraging us, that you're reminding us that we are strong, that you're reminding us that, God, you, you are with us. You're reminding us that we can overcome. You're reminding us, God, that our sins are forgiven. And so, God, I just thank you. There's so many reasons to thank you. And so, God, help us. Help us to see the world that the, the way it should be seen, yeah, especially the things that are apart from you. Help us to see those things as things that don't give us life. Help us to, to say no to the, to the ungodly cravings in our hearts. Help us to say no to the sinful nature within us, God. Help us to overcome the evil one. So God, speak to us. Words of encouragement. Speak to us, God. The way that we need to be um, saying no. Uh, speak to us, God, in ways that we can show, show how much we love you. So God, reveal to us again that you are our Father. Reveal to us again that we are your children. Reveal to us again, God, that this world is not our home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
just passing through. I'm just passing through. So I'll leave it all behind just to be with you. Be with you. All right, let's close this time with some announcements. Uh, first of all, you'll see the Zoom uh, meeting ID and password at the bottom. Again, tip for you, Zoom now, now uh, you can look at the history of all your past meetings, so you don't have to type it in every time. Just click on the little arrow to the, to the right side of the, the um, place where you enter in the ID, and you can scroll down to find our SVBC Sunday service Zoom meeting. Um, but if you need to write it down again, there it is right there. All right. Same announcement every week, guys, because it's so important. Now is the time to pray. Send your prayer requests to me if you want to be praying uh, and you want the church to be praying alongside you. Um, or if you want to join our weekly prayer meeting, it's at Friday at 8 p.m. You talk to me or talk to William Huang about that one. Next announcement is life groups. You want to, um, you know, just because things are all done online doesn't mean that um, life groups have stopped. In fact, actually, our, our life groups are still going. They're, we're all meeting online, and um, some of us are using Zoom. Other people are using other things. Um, but the idea is to grow together in community, grow together spiritually. Um, and so if you want more info, um, if you're not in a life group, it doesn't mean just because we're not meeting and physically that you can't, you can't join. Um, in fact, I feel like it's even easier now to, to start up to start up groups where we can just start a Zoom meeting, and that's a life group. So um, if you are interested in joining a life group where you can grow together with other people um, spiritually, um, email me again. My email's right there, Sebastian at SouthbayBibleChurch.org for more info, life groups again. Next is our COVID-19 Community Care Initiative. I want to just thank you guys so much for, for nominating, and I want to encourage you again, keep nominating, keep finding the needs in your own communities. And you can go to our website, um, SouthbayBibleChurch.org slash CCC to find all the links that you need there. And um, just want to thank you again um, for giving uh, to the ministry of this church. And uh, we know that's a tough economic time, so you know every dollar counts, and we just want to thank you so much for your faithful giving. Continue to give online, and you can also find the address to mail um, your tithes in on our website. With that, I want to ask you to stand. Raise your hands for the benediction. God, we declare that this world is not our home. We declare that, God, in you we are home, that you are our Father, and that we are your children. So, God, help us to live into that identity each and every moment, each and every day. And I pray that, God, as we, we go from this place, that you would fill us with encouragement, that you would fill us with your love so that we can be sources of encouragement to others as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. See you on Zoom.